If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum leadership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. I love Anchor because it's really easy to use, very accessible to record your podcast, and has excellent sound quality. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Alrighty. So hello, I am ever Evergening Butterfly bringing to you Living with an Invisible Learning Challenge where we will discuss the challenges and triumphs of those with nonverbal learning disabilities. In today's podcast, we will discuss what it's like to date with NLD and quirkiness of NLD. I am joined by Trey, who I met in a support group for people with NLD. I will ask him some questions about his life with NLD, and then we'll discuss the topic of dating. So, Trey, um, will you begin by uh, telling me a little bit about yourself and um, how you found out that you um, had NLD? Uh, Well, I am 21 years old. Um, I'm a resident of the nation's capital of Canada, Ottawa, Um, have been my entire life. And I actually found out I had NLD very early on in life. I think I was about nine years old in the third grade. Mm-hmm. And uh, this, this older, um, what do you call it? A, uh, not, not, not an educational assistant, but a, a resource teacher. There you go. Um, pulled me out of class and had me conduct a bunch of tests. Um, I forget what most of them were, but one of them uh, was she laid a bunch of pennies out on a, on a table and had me pick them up with my right hand and put them into a, a little bowl and then with my left hand. And I have no idea what that was evaluating, <laughs> but, um, you know, it was a bunch of uh, sort of uh, little tests like that. And then uh, my parents were notified that I had NLD and I was notified that uh, something was going on with my brain. Um, And I kind of took it as an insult to begin with because uh, I was quite a good student uh, at that point in my life. Um, It was very excelling in math and language. Um, And, uh, a lot of other things that, you know, sort of branch off from those two uh, core fundamentals. Um, and so I was, I, was, I was pretty mad, which, uh, you know, uh, maybe, maybe other NLDers would uh, uh, relate to, maybe not, I'm not sure. Um, and uh, I actually was invited by the University of Michigan. Uh, They they flew out, uh, my mom and I, Mm -hmm. for a couple days uh, to um, conduct some research on me, you know, NLD, but through me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And they gave me a bunch of tests, kind of like, kind of like the ones I was given to determine whether or not I had it. Uh, and I, uh, you know, uh, escapes my memory exactly what most of them were, but one of them that I found, uh, uh, incredibly frustrating was I had to draw a very complex shape with a lot of lines. And I just, I, I, I really didn't want to, I found it incredibly tiresome on my brain. Um, but I had to, if I wanted the, uh, $100 $100 gift card that they promised me as a reward. Uh, so there was that. Um, and then they had me do a CAT scan. Uh, have you ever had one of those? I have. Oh, uh, yeah. 
Cool. Uh, so, so, you know, it's uh, maybe for those who don't know, it's, um, it's a brain scan where they use magnets to uh, look at the activity in your brain. Mm -hmm. um, you go into like a giant tube, basically you're lying down and uh, I'm, I'm kind of predisposed to claustrophobia. So I had a bit of a rough time with it, but um, mm -hmm. you know, I pulled through, I was watching Jumanji for a bit. Uh, and then I, uh, uh, yeah, so, and then they gave me a printout of uh, my brain scan that I got to look at, and that was rather interesting uh, at that age. And, um, you know, that was uh, just about the most uh, academic and theoretical my experience with NLD ever got for a while until I read uh, that great book, um, NLD from the Inside Out. I think you might have told me you read it. Yes, I've read it too. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great one. Yes, it for, is. For uh, uh, just explaining the, the neuroscience and everything. It's, it's a, can I swear? Sure. It's a bitch to read <laughs> if you don't know much about brains. And I know very, very little about brains because I took a year of uh, psychology at university. So, mm -hmm. um, but there was still all sorts of shit that flew right over my head. Um, but it's still, it's um, e e even uh, what the layman, the, the complete layman would get from that book is uh, inc incredibly helpful, even if you have to read it uh, once or twice over. Yeah, it's not a very easy book to read. Not accessible, no. Yeah, I definitely got a lot from it. Um, I remember when I got diagnosed with NLD, I was um, 19 and- oh, yeah. um, I, um, I had a lot of tests done as well. And I don't remember the name of all of them, but I had, I think I had a similar one to what you had because I remember having to copy images and that was really hard for me to do. Just having to remember what the image looked like and having to be so exact. Right. Um, so I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> Did they give you the, um, uh, I, I just remembered they also gave me uh, uh, pages upon pages, like, you know, like a hundred or 200 questions that were uh, never, sometimes, often, always. Or, uh, or something like that? Um, I don't remember if they did, but they might have. Okay, so they, they gave me this one, and uh, um, there, was, there were some questions in there that were crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, um, well, they were, they were statements, and you're... Uh, one of them was, uh, I drink 50 glasses of milk every day. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, I just, I read a couple ahead um, as I was filling it out. And I asked the, uh, uh, the researcher, I, I think it was a man, um, uh, hey, what's up with this one? This is mm -hmm. like stupid. And he, um, he, he kind of smiled and he said, uh, uh, when you're done, I'll, t I'll tell you the purpose of that. <laughs> and so, um, so I finished it up and he basically told me that uh, uh, that one was in there to make sure I was paying attention. <laughs> and, and were and you? I, yes, I was. Good. And, um, I, well, I think um, the... The, the purpose of putting that in there um, in a uh, 
an evaluation of uh, NLD was to evaluate, um, well, I, I, I guess the, um, maybe the note he would have made was that, uh, was going to the uh, observation, I guess you find a lot in NLD literature that mm -hmm. says we pay extraordinary attention to detail. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is very true. Um, I was also wondering if you um, knew what uh, for you caused the NLD? Well, um, it's very uh, tricky to say because it's, um, they say it's either genetic or trauma induced. Right. Uh, and I, I, I don't think either of my parents or anyone else in my family has it. So I can only assume that it was trauma induced. Mm -hmm. And I, I have this, um, well, I, I hadn't, uh, an experience when I was two years old. It was about two or three days from Christmas, uh, so December 23rd or 22nd, and um, my parents and I were in a mall, and I wandered off as two-year-olds two do, um, and uh, I shit my pants as two-year-olds sometimes do. Um, and I, I just, I, I was lost. So I, I hit because I was scared and it was a long time. And I have zero recollection of this. This was all uh, told to me mm -hmm. uh, years later. Um, and I, I do think um, that would be what caused it because I read in the book, uh, NLD from the inside out, good one to pick up um that uh in in the ages um in the very formative ages you know when you're a newborn at the time you're four years old uh you can experience something very uh uh cortically activating, so a, a big rush of cortisol that actually like damages your brain in the specific way that uh, leads to a person developing a uh, nonverbal learning disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that would have been the trauma that caused it. It's my best guess. Yeah, I can see why you would um, guess that and I'm I'm sorry that you had to go through that because I can imagine it wasn't your fault was it no but it, <laughs> it doesn't Were you there? Like a pleasant experience no no but I don't remember it so yeah um, and that's probably a good thing that you don't remember it um, I would imagine that your mind probably blotted out of your memory um, but, um, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know if you want to know how I know, uh, that I have NLD or not. Um, I, I think you may have hinted at it in our, in our conversations previously, but, uh, you can, you can run it by me again. Right. Yeah. So, um, from the tests that I had, um, they said that I was born with it and um, ever since I was diagnosed with it, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I was born with it. And I also have been kind of thinking that it might have come from my dad because um, right he was um, adopted and so we don't know that much about uh, his lineage and right yeah 
So what happened to him between two and four? Exactly. Yeah. So it, it could be genetic from him. Um, so that would make sense to me. Um, yeah. If you're comfortable with uh, sharing, um, how does it feel for you to uh, have an LD? Um, well, that's an interesting question because I don't have anything to compare it to. I'm not mm -hmm. one of those people who claims to remember their past lives and they don't mm -hmm. even believe in reincarnation. So, uh, but you know, that's that's beside the point. I. Um, uh, I, I feel like I'm very verbally facile compared to most people. Um, uh, and I always have been uh, very, very talky, very, um, um, I always read a grade or two above my, uh, my reading level was, was always um, a, a bit ahead of uh, my peers. Um, math uh, was never a challenge for me until about grade nine, when two things sort of happened. Uh, one, math became a lot harder, as it does. Um, uh, in Canada, we call it grade nine. Uh, Yes, mm -hmm. uh, sophomore year, yeah. um, or fr uh, freshman year, freshman year, yeah, freshman. high school. Um, mm -hmm. So the the subject itself became a lot more theoretical and a lot more difficult. And I was put in uh, uh, the the higher level courses because I'd always been, I'd always pulled uh, 80s in math. Um, mm -hmm. But at that point in my life, um, I was pretty volatile, um, to use the, uh, the uh, big five term, I, I believe neuroticism breaks down into volatility and something else. So I was very, um, uh, uh, uncooperative i had some uh, some serious anger issues um because you know uh, school is school and uh you know it's not it's a like it's not fun and it you know maybe it shouldn't be fun but it uh, definitely should uh get with the times a little bit i think i think they're trying uh and and failing on every level mm. uh to do so um but so i i've, I've always been this very oh uh, no sorry math um and i i was also i so i was put on uh, due to these these anger issues, I was put on uh, Risperidone. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have uh, experience with that. Not taking it, but I think I do know what it is. Yeah, it's it's an antipsychotic medication, and um, so that really really uh, flattened me um, in my. Uh, my day to day, I, I was sleeping in excess, um, and I would. This was before I started uh, drinking coffee, so I didn't have anything to buttress the uh, the excessive sleeping with. Mm. Um, and I, I would, uh, I had math second period, and I would just zonk out every day because this medication I was on just made me, uh, gave me, gave me friggin' narcolepsy. Um, and so from then on, I just kind of decided F math, you know, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm going to pour everything I have into 
uh, like English and history and um, uh, psychology, anthropology, um, the, the humanities and the social sciences. You know, I thought, I thought that was better fit for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I did. And uh, then I, I tried doing that kind of stuff in university for a year. And I decided that I just hated those people. I, I was so annoyed on a day-to-day -day basis with the uh, bloated and intrusive bureaucracy of the university uh, that I that I just couldn't, and so now I'm uh, uh, I'm just kind of uh, doing my thing, you know, making some money, um, and I'm I'm trying to uh, rally my my little band together, uh, see if I can monetize my creativity, which is a very very difficult thing to do but i'm going to try it because if i don't try i'll never know uh and if that doesn't work out i think i'll go into massage therapy because i think as a result of having nld i actually have a an over sensitivity to touch mm. and i can't prove that because mm. i've never been in anyone else's body but um i just give a damn good massage <laughs> You know, it's a, it's a two-year program to uh, become a an R. Blah, excuse me, uh, a two-year degree to become a an RMT, registered massage therapist, and uh, I think I could do that for the rest of my life. So, if I if I need to. That sounds like that would be something that um, would be uh, nice to do, and I. I know when I, um, I've tried to getting massages as well and, um, you know, giving it to friends or family members, they have told me that I do well with it as well. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have thought about that until you had mentioned it. <laughs> do you feel like your, uh, sensitivity to, um, I, I feel like, well, first of all, my vision is pretty good. I have asphyxiation in both eyes, so things kind of go a little fuzzy for me mm -hmm. at a distance. But overall, I have very good vision. I have a very keen sense of smell. Uh, my hearing is very good. Um, and I think I'm oversensitive to touch. Do you uh, share any of those? Um, I would say... Well, I wear, I've been wearing glasses since I was eight years old. So okay. I, I'm uh, nearsighted. Um, and I do have very good verbal and uh, memory and auditory memory. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know about the sense of smell. I mean... I don't know if it's heightened, but I, I, I do smell things um, pretty well. <laughs> I smell things too. <laughs> um, but I know that when it comes to verbal and auditory memory, I am very good at remembering people's names and... Yes, yes. Scenes from movies really well. Lines of dialogue. Exactly. Like you'll remember them exactly as the person said them in exactly the same tone of voice. Yes. Yeah. Um, and like music, when I listen to a song, I think it only takes like maybe once or twice for me to hear it and I know it by, I know every word of it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how my brain does that. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's like, I'm okay with not knowing how it does it. I just, I'm glad that it does. 
Yeah, well, I, I think um, it takes all different types for the world to function. Exactly. I would agree with that. Um, so, yeah, it, I, I would agree with you that it's, it's hard to know um, how, how to feel with NLD because both of us, you know, we don't have another life to um, compare it to. It's the only yeah. life we're consciously aware of. Um, it's like I, I, I always thought, I always think of the movie uh, Avatar. Yes. You know, when they put him in the other body, like how yeah. weird that would feel. Yeah, that would feel very weird. You uh, yeah. need years upon years to like uh, figure out all the nuances of it. Yeah. Exactly. And, you know, I've, there have been times where I've, you know, try to figure out what life would be like without an LD. And it's like, you know, yes, it would be different, but I, it's hard to imagine how it would, it would be different. And I don't know if, you know, some things would be easier, but I don't know if I would. You, you don't know. know if you would trade it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Me neither. It would be my mind. <laughs> like it's literally, it's your brain. It's you. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's what I always try to um, uh, say to my friends who are dealing with uh, uh, other sort. like I have this friend with uh, ADHD and I tell him, mm -hmm. uh, you, you you can't lay your problems at the feet of just your ADHD. Mm. Like you can sort of um, evaluate your problems and say, okay, uh, I, I have this problem because of ADHD, but you can't use it as an excuse because it is part of you mm -hmm. that you have to learn to um, uh, operate successfully within. That's very good advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you've already talked about some of the challenges that you um, have with NLD. Um, but are there any that you can think of that you haven't mentioned? Um, well, uh, <laughs> I, um, I definitely struggle with impulsivity. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I went through a bit of a rebellious stage at the tail end of my high school career and a couple of years after where I, I smoked a lot of pot, you know, um, and I, I threw it, I experimented with some other stuff here or there, but um, it, the main thing for me was weed and uh, what it taught me beyond that I have problems with self-control, which I already knew, but like it made it more real for me. Um, it, uh, it, 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 it was a lot of the experiences I had with weed were, uh, educational in being sensitive to other people. Hmm. Um, and I, maybe you can relate to this. I, I, when I was young, say about 15, 16, all the way down to, you know, being a real little, little kid, mm -hmm. um, I was just this blunt instrument, you know, I would, <laughs> um, I was just coldly focused on the facts. I didn't care about anybody else's feelings and I could barely struggle to picture what other people were feeling. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, now, uh, maybe one will come to me, but uh, since then, 
with uh, weed and just with age and experience, um, I'm sort of learning to uh, um, imagine, um, d develop my theory of mind for how uh, other people are feeling at a mm -hmm. given moment in a, in a present set of circumstances, that kind of thing. Yeah, that, that makes more sense. That makes sense. Um, I can definitely relate to that because I remember when, um, when I was young, I was probably when I was about, um, I would say in my teens and before then probably eight, age eight to 12, um, I w struggled with um, picking up on um, how other people were feeling and being empathetic um, and sympathizing with other people's feelings. Um, and I think now I still have a little bit of struggle with that um, because of all those years that I um, just right. do it naturally. And it's a, it's a double-edged sword, right? Right. Because, um, uh, and, and I have a, uh, best friend, uh, from Lebanon, mm -hmm. who I'm very grateful for because he, uh, he points out all the things I'm good at, which is very nice of him. Mm. Um, and the things I'm, uh, I'm, uh, struggling with that I might not be too aware of, which is a very good friend to have. Yes. Um, you know, he's, he's not just there for me when it's easy. Uh, he admires me for my ability to just cut through the red tape of social convention. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, the parable, uh, the emperor, the emperor has no clothes. The yeah. emperor's new clothes, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm the, the child who will call out the emperor for being naked. <laughs> A lot of the time, you know. Um, but as, as you get older, sometimes you got to realize, and like, uh, just let the emperor do his thing. He's not hurt anyone. Yeah, that's a good um, metaphor to to use because at, as you were um, as you were saying, you know, it's not not always good to call people out. Um, and it's not always necessary. Right, it's not always necessary. Yeah, um, and. I, I know for me, I, I'm getting better at um, not only sympathizing with how people feel, but um, trying to pick up on how my tone of voice might be in certain situations when I'm talking to people um, because I want to make sure that I'm not making them feel in a way that um, I'm not intending to. Right. I feel, I feel like a Vulcan sometimes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> were you ever into Star Trek? Um, a little bit, but maybe you could explain what you mean by Vulcan. Yeah. Well, I, I went through a bit of a phase. Um, uh, Mr. Spock was a mm -hmm. Vulcan. Yeah, they have pointy ears and yeah. strange haircuts. Um, and they're a race of humanoid people who are completely logical. They have no emotion. And so they just kind of um, will coldly and callously dissect the situation and not, uh, not take feelings into account. Mm. Okay. And so, uh, it, it, 
you had Spock, you had Kirk, who was kind of like the mediator between uh, uh, him. Uh, Kirk was like the mediator between Spock and uh, I'm blanking on the guy's name. Uh, it might have been Scotty, the engineer. But it might have also been someone else who, who was more like the, uh, the straight, like, human uh, side. It was, it was more uh, not just feelings, you know, like just this um, well of empathy, I would say, mm -hmm. and, and this, this very human sort of uh, perspective that is uh, not, that is frequently illogical, but despite that, it's, it's part of us, you know? Right. And it's, it's, uh, uh, you, you, you can debate whether that's a, a good thing or a, a bad thing, but I don't think, um, Every, I don't think everything that is good is logical. I'll say that. Yeah, I, I can definitely pick up on, well, on what you're saying because I can think of moments where I have been blunt or very literal and it's like, I didn't need to be that way you can, you can, um, uh, there's, there's a song. Do you know Jewel? No, I haven't heard of that. She's a, she's a singer from the 80s. Um, I guess you would call her a, a pop folk singer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, she, she had this song, uh, I'm Sensitive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that I actually quite like. I can't listen to it all the time because it's just so, uh, uh, one node and uh, but but sometimes it really it's it's a nice little hug from my heart mm. um, where she goes um, boom, 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 boom. it doesn't take a talent to be mean and words can crush things that are unseen so please be careful with me I'm sensitive and I'd like to stay that way. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it speaks to this um, inherent uh, fragility mm -hmm. of human beings that, uh, and you know, this might actually be a good segue into dating because uh, uh, my longest relationship lasted a year um, it ended right around this time of the year last year. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was, it was a hard breakup to take because I thought I was going to marry this girl. Mm. Um, and she was very sensitive. Like we met when I was 20 and she was 19. And even by like teenage girl standards, she was, she was very sensitive, had a lot of uh, anxiety and, uh, you know, some more, uh, more physical health problems. Um, and I was often too blunt for her, mm. you know, and that was something I, I had to learn to uh, get a handle on um, cause we were living together for a point. Um, yeah, because, um, in an argument, I, I, I'm more verbally facile than, uh, almost anyone, any other person I meet. So logically I could just demolish her. Mm cut her to ribbons, you know, and uh, I, I had to be careful with that because 
it's like it's like if you had a little puppy you know uh if if the puppy annoys you are you gonna destroy it great you solve the problem but now you don't have a puppy anymore <laughs> you know so um I, I the english common law tradition of minimal necessary force was a very good uh um, principle for me to uh, embody and understand in my uh, in our disputes, let's say. Um, because you have to have disputes in a relationship or uh, rather they're going to happen. Right. You know, there's no relationship without disputes because uh, newsflash people are different. Uh, they think different things, they feel different ways. Um, and sometimes you're gonna be right and sometimes your partner is gonna be right. And um, it, it's, it's, it's never even that simple that one person is right and one person is wrong uh, because you know this person will be right about a, B, and C, and this other person will be right about X, Y, and Z, and you have to um, uh, you have to really keep a cool head and uh, uh, and listen very well, even when um, it hurts you to hear what they have to say. Uh, because if you don't listen to your partner um, and you just go on, you're just going to go on hurting them. If you don't listen to your partner when they tell you how you're hurting them. You, you, your, your aim should never be to win the argument, I don't think. It should always be for peace in the long term. Very true. Um, yeah, I, I can remember um, the last relationship I had um, lasted almost five months and um, I thought it was pretty serious for me too. I thought he might be, might have been the one, and um, it. We had we. I wasn't very blunt in it, but I feel like because um, I'm not very good at arguing, I can't stand up for myself, but. Mm. I feel like um, there were, I know there were times where I did hurt him and I did listen to him when he brought it up. But I think the issue for me was I, um, you know, I wasn't very honest to him about some things that. Um, right. I, doing and I should have been honest because that's a very you know honesty and trust is a is very key in any relationship uh yeah it's it's very important to tell each other the truth um sorry you you said you weren't honest with the things you were feeling not feeling but um um like one of the examples was um, I was living with him too, and I had shared with my parents the address of where he lives just to keep me safe, and he didn't know that I had done that. Um, and he wasn't okay with that when he found that out. And I guess uh. I didn't really understand why he wasn't okay with that. 
Well, the, um, I very much understand both sides of that mm-hmm. because, uh, on the side of your parents, it's not about him, you know, it's, um, it's about their daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just want to know where you are just in case, <laughs> Right. you know, it's not, they're not worried specifically that he's going to beat you up, right. but they're worried. Um, and they're, they're not even worried at this point. They just need that reassurance there that, uh, uh, they can go, they know where you are in case you, um, fall off the map and, uh, and are in trouble in some way. But I also understand why he would be upset about that mm-hmm. because to him, uh, you know, subjectively it might feel like he's being persecuted. It doesn't sound like he was, he was any kind of a bad guy. No, he wasn't. No. So, um, yeah, but then there you might've learned a lesson about, uh, the importance of transparency yeah and uh uh defining and characterizing actions that you're taking as you're taking them so that people don't uh find out about them later and go hey what the fuck you know right yeah Yeah, being very clear and upfront with people what you're doing right and why you're doing it yeah exactly yeah so that if they have issues with it that you can know why right in the beginning and not later on when it may be too late Mm -hmm. yeah 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 you said it yeah i felt for like for me when i found out that it why you know, why he had issues with that one. It was like, okay, well, it's kind of, you know, too late. They already know I can't take it back. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And, you know, there were other things that I kept from him. And because I kept doing that, that was what, why our relationship ended. Um, for you, um, was the arguing and the bluntness, the, um, main things that were challenging in your relationship? Sorry, I, I muted myself by mistake. Oh, uh, what was the question? I was just asking if the, um, arguments and the bluntness and were the main things that were challenging for you and your relationship? Um, well, uh, I really had to, um, A lot of the challenges for me stemmed from my own uh, bluntness. Um, we didn't fight a lot, but when we fought, we really fought. Mm. Um, and so I would often be blindsided because she would um, uh, not tell me what she was feeling as she was feeling it. Mm. Um, and I think in my future relationships, I'm going to demand that, (laughs) you know, in, in polite way, but, uh, uh, firm way, because, um, I, I would often get blindsided with, uh, these 15 things that she's gonna, uh, cycle in between and, um, you know, literally have panic attacks about that I would have to um, uh, soothe her out of 
to get to the root of the problem. Mm. And she was just, just so sensitive um, in those moments in particular that uh, uh, it would be difficult to um, say anything without her taking it the wrong way. Mm. And so I, I, uh, I became a person who's very careful with his words <laughs> since then. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. I know, um, n not really with dating, but when I'm talking to my family, I do try to pay attention to what I'm saying and the tone that I'm saying it in because I want to be careful that they're not um, taking it in the wrong way because I I don't want to you know hurt their feelings or make them feel in a different way that I didn't intend to. Mm -hmm. My mom is very um, uh, I'm I'm a lot more uh, uh, on the intuitive side. I don't know if you know uh, Myers Briggs. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. So I'm an ENTJ, mm -hmm. and so I have uh, extroverted thinking, introverted intuition, extroverted sensing, and introverted feeling. And I strongly believe my mom is an ESTJ. Mm -hmm. And so we've got the same deciders, that uh, big strong TE up front and the weak underdeveloped mm -hmm. uh, F FI at the bottom. But she has SI and NE in the mm -hmm. middle and I have NI and SE. And so that's, that's a lot of conflict right there. <laughs> um, I, uh, wh what's your type? So I have... Um. It's been a while since I've taken it, um, but I think I'm E N E um, E N F J something like that. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah, cool. I I'll, think I ahead. think my sister is one of those. Yeah. Um, yeah. That would mean that we have the same uh, NISE in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's called an extroverted protagonist, something like that. Yeah, I, uh, extrovert intuitive feeler judger. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so uh, with my mom, the reason uh, NI and SI don't get along mm -hmm. is because, uh, well, picture SI as like an account. Mm -hmm. He's very concerned with like, okay, where are the facts? Where are the numbers? Mm -hmm. What is what is happening? They're tracking. Um, Okay, so you're, you're extroverted observer, whether that's SE or NE, that's your gatherer, right? It goes in it. So for me, I gather sensory details, like uh, um, you know, just, just facts. I have a good memory for like facts, random ones that have no use to me in everyday life. But that, that one out of 15 will come in super handy. So I uh, continuously, uh, I, I am grateful for my continuous memorization of them. Um, but the, the introverted observer, so whether that's NI or SI, is tracking. Mm. Um, and so with the sensory, it's paying very close attention to uh, actions and consequences in the real world. And with NI, it's paying very close attention 
to ideas and how they form and um, how they evolve, where they came from, what they suggest, implications. Um, and so those are the observers that we lean on, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really like we're speaking two different languages. Like I'll, I'll, I'll say something like, uh, I had a painful childhood, which I think is true. I, you know, I just, I had a rough go of it. I experienced a lot of anger, a lot of pain. Um, but she'll take that to mean I'm saying that they were abusive, my parents. Mm. And she starts to say, you don't know how good you had it. And I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Mm. I'm saying I have this, this thing, this problem with my brain that's, you know, a, a lot of work to deal with. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, pain and trial and tribulation that, uh, you know, it takes a toll on you. Yeah. Okay. Um, was there anything else you wanted to mention about uh, dating or about, um, or do you want to go into the other topic you wanted to talk about? Well, um, I was pretty excited to jump into dating from a very young age. I can remember having crushes on girls mm -hmm. since the second grade. You know, I was, I was very early on that boat. Uh, I'm a Taurus, uh, and that's ruled by Venus. So, um, you know, love and beauty and all that. I'm a lover, not a fighter. Um, but if you hurt someone I love, I'll fight you. Uh, and when it got to high school, um, I was just all over any girl. I had uh, the slightest like moment of attraction to. Um, and that, you know, uh, ended up with me on my face a lot. <laughs> but I also had a lot of fun. And it, uh, because I wanted that, uh, uh, that love and companionship so badly, it, uh, uh, it, it really, it forced me out of my shell and I, I became very good at uh, uh, talking to women, comparatively speaking, to uh, all the other joker dudes that I <laughs> knew. And um, yeah, so I, I very quickly became uh, my school's like uh, love guru almost. I would give people relationship advice. I would set, I set a couple couples up Mm -hmm. That was pretty, that was pretty fun to watch. And I always had kind of my, uh, my cult following, I, I like to say, of, uh, of girls who were into um, tall, slender, uh, elven looking dudes who were into, uh, they were mostly like, punky punk rock type girls who played guitar and um, you know, later uh, later smoked weed and uh, we're, we're just into that scene, you know. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I can, um, th that's interesting, I can, um, I, I wonder um, how you felt when you were um, helping people uh, start relationships. Um, I felt like 
um, felt like I had a muscle imbalance, really. Uh, I felt like I was very advanced in this sort of um, uh, log logical way um, that I could very objectively like uh, sort out people's problems for them. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I still couldn't have any girl I wanted because uh, uh, you, you, you just can't do that. <laughs> it's not a, there, there are very, very, very few men who can have any woman they want. Even Johnny Depp, I bet, has, uh, <laughs> has some girls who are uh, off limits for him. Some women, I should say. Mm -hmm. I was just laughing at that because I'm, I, I've seen a lot of Johnny Depp movies and he's hilarious. Yeah, he's a good looking dude too. Yeah. And charismatic. He's, he's on another world. He, he bought like a village in France. I didn't know I, that. I, I don't even understand it. <laughs> how, do you, how do you buy a village? Do you buy like... Uh, all the industry there or like crown yourself king I don't understand you probably would have to buy a good amount of the whatever mining oh. company is there yeah um, I do remember uh, I was just thinking about dating I do remember having a lot of um, crushes on guys as well when I was um, actually when I was in middle school and and high school um, right and and, uh, and college too because it's you know you know it was that's normal and uh, you just feel this eagerness to like yeah. jump right into the dating thing Exactly. You, you, even like, like you said, middle school before uh, everybody else kind of understands what the fuck to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I didn't really start dating until I was in college, but. Um, that's, I mean, that was because um, I wasn't in a, typical school I was actually um homeschooled so oh okay um it was different for me I the only social part of my life was when I would um go to church and um right. see my friends there so that would be where I would interact with people and um I didn't really get to be more social until I got to college because then that was normal school. That honestly sounds like so much fun though. <laughs> it was. And schooling and your, and your social group is your church. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I went to Catholic school, but I was, I've been in, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess I've been an agnostic leaning towards atheism since about seven or eight years old. Mm -hmm. I just kind of decided like, you know, NLDers were very literal minded. Um, so I was like, yep. hmm, I've never seen anyone split a seed. I've never seen anyone rise from the dead. <laughs> so, you know, I get the feeling that all this stuff might be made up. But you know, as, as I get older, I got a lot less uh, militant about atheism. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I settled down a lot from that. Um, and I kind of realized like, oh, there's this whole like intellectual perspective of Christianity that uh, ardent atheists kind of like to straw man away from because, um, 
you can't unequivocally say that's stupid. You know, it's just, it's, it's culture and tradition and, um, uh, nobody knows. And so God is just kind of like this, um, uh, this, um, amalgamated sort of, uh, uh, idea of, uh, of a benevolent creator that we, uh, uh, that our ancestors, uh, built our culture on the presupposition of, and, um, and it's, a lot of it is not meant to be taken particularly literally, I don't think. The Bible, um, as, as I read and uh, read things people have written about it uh, these days, I've, I've had a resurgence of interest in it, um, is more like poetry, mm-hmm. mythology. Uh, just a sec, somebody's knocking on my door. I'm just going to... Oh, that's okay. This advertisement is part of a charitable initiative in partnership with Democracy Works. Please note that this is an unpaid opportunity. The goal of this initiative is to increase voter accessibility and encourage my listeners to get their vote out during the 2020 general election this November. Voter participation in the U.S. is critically low and 60% of non-voters don't vote because of difficulties understanding the process and effects of voter suppression. These issues disproportionately affect historically disenfranchised and marginalized communities. This election is very important to getting our democracy back, so please vote. That's what podcasts are for. Yep. Um, I mean... I liked how you were talking about God because that I can definitely relate to that because um, I mean, I, like I said before, I do tend to take things literal, literally because of having an LD mm-hmm. and I still have to catch myself many times just in my mind saying to myself, don't take this literally. You don't have to say out loud what you're thinking. Right. You know, um, and I try to, you know, be more black and white, or not black and white, more gray, um, instead of black and white, because it's a, it's, you know, it's just a good thing to practice. Yeah, it's it's a, a direction that uh, the NLD brain sort of pushes you in to uh, view things in black and white, and so you always got to fight against that. Right. Do we want to move on to uh, the other subject? Sure. Yeah, I think we've already kind of begun to touch upon of the quirkiness of NLD, but yeah, if you want to start on... Um, saying a little bit about that you can well um i've i've always been um uh especially when i was younger i was a lot more introverted um i like to read and i like to uh play with my legos and my uh my little action figures um and when i would play as a kid um it's interesting. I, t- I talked to my best friend, the one I mentioned about this, mm-hmm. um, and he's in his uh, third year. I think he just wrapped up his third year uh, in engineering. Mm-hmm. So he's a person who is very interested in things. Like when when he would play as a kid, he would play with these like science kits where he'd mine rocks out of a little. Uh, block of concrete um <clears throat> he was very interested in like cars and guns and uh uh stuff you know mm-hmm. and um i was not like that i i liked uh 
uh, I liked weapons too, uh, as a lot of little boys do. I, uh, but I was more into swords, bow staffs. Uh, I, I really, really liked swords. Um, uh, but more than that, I was into uh, story, fiction, narrative. Mm -hmm. I, I liked to read very much. Um, I loved uh, TV uh, and movies. And uh, whenever I would play with my Legos or my action figures, um, there would always be a story to it. Mm -hmm. it, it would always be uh, like there there was a live action uh, G.I. Joe movie that came out when I was um, uh, I can't remember how old I was I might have been about 10 mm -hmm. uh, and I bought well I didn't buy I, I had purchased for me uh, a bunch of the uh, the toys and uh, uh, the novelization of it, which was only like 138 pages. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but so I read that and uh, I didn't think much of the movie. You know, um, I liked that there was a, a real representation of the characters on screen that I could watch. But uh, I'd like to uh, go off and uh, invent my own stories with the action figures. You know, Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow would be fighting way up here on the top of my bookshelf. And uh, uh, down here, Duke and uh, uh, Lieutenant whoever. And, you know, they'd be fighting with the Cobra guys, shooting it out. And uh, uh, somebody would be trying to steal this, like, artifact that would... Uh, uh, that would destroy the world <laughs> and all that stuff. And uh, later, um, uh, as my love of uh, fiction got a little more adult and uh, sophisticated, I started to really, really get into movies um, to a lesser extent TV, but I, I really loved uh, movies um, and, uh, and comic books. Uh, like I, I, I sort of grew up, um, you know, I, I was, I was born in 1999. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was a year after Blade came out, mm -hmm. a year before X-Men came out, uh, and two years before Spider-Man came out. And then all the sequels and everything were coming out uh, to those movies. So I grew up in the first generation of like uh, really high tech uh, superhero movies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really loved Spider-Man and Batman. Um, and uh, as I got older, I really started to like Superman mm -hmm. because um, uh, I, I sort of appreciated the the sophistication of the writing, um, and even even now, like um, I, I find these new uh, these new interests in fiction. Um, right now, I'm reading uh, uh, Crime and Punishment in the Gulag Archipelago. Mm -hmm. uh, which are by two um, Russian novelists, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky and uh, Alexander Sol Solzhenitsyn. Um, and that's, that's some bleak stuff. So I have to uh, periodically <laughs> read or watch something lighthearted to uh, just sort of, whew, okay, yeah. Fyodor, I get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, always been, you know, that left brain guy who, who likes, uh, like stories and fiction and stand up comedy. And, and recently, um, I don't know if you play video games. I have. Yeah. Well, uh, there's this, uh, God of War sequel that came out in 2018, I believe. Um, 
and uh, God of War is a video game series about this uh, this man uh, who's a, a Spartan. You know, uh, three hundred. Um, I think I've heard of it. Okay, well, it, it tells the story, a very fictionalized story, of uh, the 300 uh, supposedly Spartan warriors who held the line against the Persian army, the invading Persian army. Right. Um, and Spartans were these super tough warriors in their day. I mean, they were probably all about... Uh, half a foot to a foot shorter than me <laughs> but um you know they just had these these brutal lives full of uh uh essentially torture to uh toughen them up to the point where they could uh where they were the ultimate warriors at the time and so uh kratos is is one of these guys who um uh, makes a deal with Ares, the god of war, uh, to give him godlike powers, but uh, any uh, um, he, uh, he also becomes uh, like his his hand, his tool, mm -hmm. Ares. Um, and so you know, long story, very long story, very short. Uh, Kratos uh, uh, gets in a spat with Ares and, and kills him, and that's the first game. And then uh, goes to the third game where um, Kratos is angry at all the gods. And so he climbs Mount Olympus with the Titans uh, and kills everyone. Uh, Zeus is the final fight in that game. Um, and then uh, years later, like probably 10 years later in 2018, they, uh, they come out with this new God of War, just entitled God of War. Um, and it's, it's Kratos uh, with his son in Sweden, you know, the world of Norse mythology. Right. And uh, um, and so uh, he fights Balder in that game, and uh, and Thor and Odin are very uh, very talked about. And so when I when I played this game, I kind of like just fell in love with the world, the uh, sort of gallows sense of humor, and um, I did a deep dive on Norse mythology. And so like even today, I'm I'm. Uh, my interest in fiction has never waned. So that's one of the quirks, I would say. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. I definitely um, have an interest in fiction. I also have an introvert side where I love to read and a lot of the books that I read are fiction and um, have it a lot of fantasy in them and like um one of the favorite series that comes to my mind is um it's the missing children series um by margaret peterson haddix um and it's they're really good series um i don't know if you read any of her books before i've heard of it um you might want to ask my uh my younger cousin, she's uh, she's a pretty avid reader. We're both kind of the uh, punk rock black sheep of our family. <laughs> wow. She actually plays bass in my band. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I like movies too. I, um, I think I tend to, I don't know if I read more or if I watch more movies now. I think I probably tend to watch more movies now than I read, but I, I still try to do a little bit of reading. It's good for your brain. Yes, it is. Do you have a, do you have a favorite movie or a couple of favorites? Um, 
I would say my the first favorite that comes to my mind is a movie called The Secret Garden. I've never heard of that. Um, it I've read the book too. It it's about um, a girl who um, she's. I don't know if she was born in India. I don't think she was because she's her family is English, but um, okay. she lives in India for some time and then she loses her parents in a earthquake while living there. Er earthquake that starts a fire, I think. And mm. then she has to go live with her uh, uncle who is in England and um, while living with her uncle, she finds a secret garden that he has um, like behind his mansion. And right. um, she has to figure out where the key is to unlock the door to the garden because the door is covered by all these vines because it hasn't been open mm -hmm. for years um and the key is um she winds up finding it somewhere in the house and like one of the rooms that she explores um i think it was her answer that she finds it in um and when she goes to unlock it unlock the door she finds out that the garden looks like it's been not taken care of for many years um so the plants look you know very dead and not alive um, but she starts to take care of it herself and make it look beautiful and um there's also one of the other characters, her cousin, um, I don't remember, he, he's physically, like he, he's, he's physically disabled. I, I think he, because his, his uncle, like, has poor posture, so like, kind of like a hunchback almost. Okay. Um, and so, is the cousin kind of has that too and has been in a wheelchair all his life and so he can't walk hmm. um but she winds the girl winds up being able to teach the cousin how to walk oh wow and um they do that while they're in the garden and it's just about this whole movie is about just them being in the garden and becoming best friends and making the cousin realize that he's really not sick and that he you know was really just making himself believe that he was more like his uncle than he thought basically um right i i i sense some very deep themes in there yeah they are I, i'll have to check that movie out yeah and I, I liked the, the movie because it was very close to the book, which sometimes is yeah. hard for movies to do. <laughs> Things get a little lost in translation. Yeah, exactly. Um, but let me see if I can name any other movies that I like. Um, I also like The Pink Panther with Steve Martin. Those are very funny. Oh my God. So funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, I just remember many lines for them like the burger. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's so funny. Um, and I, I can think of some of the ones that Johnny Depp is in, uh, like the Pirates of the Caribbean series. Those are good and funny too because he has some funny line comical lines that he does in there 
Mm -hmm. um, I think probably also one of the quirkiness of MLD could be maybe the literal piece, you know, just how it, it's kind of unusual where you have to, where you take things pretty seriously and you have to remind yourself that it's not always black and white and that somebody can be teasing you and you have to be okay. Like, are they te you know, when they are teasing yeah. you, try to be like, read their face and it's like, okay, which can be hard for me because when my brother and my dad tease me, usually they have a very straight face. <laughs> And so it's like, I, in the I, when they were doing that, I couldn't tell that they were teasing me. I, I have a theory as to uh, why people with NLD like jokes so much is because yes. we, um, uh, it takes us a little longer to process them mm -hmm. uh, from early on in life. And so we kind of... Um, we spend a little more time analyzing it than a person who just sort of gets a joke. Um, and we kind of go, oh, haha. <laughs> and it's this click moment of, uh, of Eureka mm -hmm. that sort of happens uh, every time we get a joke. And then we're always chasing that dragon with, with more jokes. Um, and it, it teaches us to uh, be very good crafters of jokes because we sort of understand um, in a little more uh, clear detail what the elements of them are. Yeah, I would agree with you about that theory. Mm -hmm. I, I know when I got better at telling when somebody was teasing me, I was like, okay, now my job is to try to tease them back. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'm getting better at that. But now it's like, okay, when I do it to my mom or dad, they're not teasing me back. <laughs> <laughs> Which is bad because they're not letting me practice. Yeah, uh, well, you got to... Um... Uh, are are you are you mom and dad kind of introverted? But uh, whenever I do it at, to my mom, I was like, I I say I'm teasing you, and then I'm like, come on, tease me back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's that uh, um, the the play circuit mm. in, in the brain, right. All mammals have it. Yes. Um, you no, know, you can even you can even tease a dog, and a dog will understand that it's being teased. <laughs> I and if the dog has a good sense of humor, he'll uh, he'll go along with it. Yeah, that's actually true. I I can remember when um, I've tease my dog like I've made her think I'm holding a tree when I'm really not or like I'm gonna throw her toy for her to go fetch it and I don't throw it and she thinks I did and she goes looking for it <laughs> like hey something's not right here <laughs> yeah can you think of any quir any other quirks? Hmm. Uh, I I don't know. I, I think we covered the fundamentals. Yeah. Um, um I think one I, I know one kind came to my mind that uh um, oh, yeah. I think one of them is also paying attention to detail because um, I know for well, me. Well, missing the big picture. 
Yeah, exactly. That, that piece too, because I tend to do that a lot. And like a good example is I'll be um, trying to like copy and paste something on a computer and I'll just be focusing on the part that I'm, um, you know, trying to edit while I might not notice something else that is um, wrong. And yeah, so that'd be a very literal manifestation of that. Right. Yeah. I, I saw the two more as you were just talking. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, one is this weird relationship we have with personal hygiene. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I've always struggled with remembering to um, uh, not so much brush my hair because uh, I, I've always taken good care of my hair because I'm proud of it. Um, but uh always struggled with just like this basic stuff, like remembering to brush my teeth, remembering to use shampoo, um, remembering to wash my face when I wake up and when I go to bed. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's this weird thing. It's not like I, I'm making the conscious choice not to, mm -hmm. but it's like I, I, my brain physically can't or doesn't want to remember to. And I, I remember the book touching on that a bit, but I don't remember uh, specifically what he said about it. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. I can remember for, I think it was a whole summer, I forgot to brush my teeth both night and night and day. And I remember after that, I was like, okay, I'm gonna consciously try to remember to brush my teeth. <laughs> Yeah, because and... my breath was just so nasty, and it was my mouth <laughs> so dirty. And Did was... anybody have to tell you? No. <laughs> that your breath stunk? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they did. <laughs> um, but also but... handwriting. Oh yes. Yeah. That. Handwriting. Um... My handwriting was so, so bad when I was very young and it still looks uh, very messy, very chicken scratchy. Mm. And I, I write very large and like low resolution. Like you can tell that's a G, that's an R. Um, mm. But if it was written any smaller, you wouldn't be able to because it's so like warped and I can't draw for shit. I was just laughing because I can definitely relate to both of those things. I yeah, yeah. used to have very big handwriting and it was legible, but it was, you know, legible to me, you know, and um, I've worked on it and making it smaller but so legible to others and neater and um i mean i don't write anymore i use the computer more than mm -hmm. handwriting so it doesn't really that was effort well spent <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think the only thing i do handwriting now is signing well i used to sign checks but i don't really do that much anymore it gets deposited automatically into my account um but I definitely have issues with, um, I was trying to remember the other example you gave. Drawing. Oh, drawing. Thank you. Yeah, drawing. Um, yeah, I, I don't draw well either. And um, I mean, I like to try to do it, but I'm not very good at it. I wish I could draw. <laughs> 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 because well look i um you you can see my my profile picture there right yeah it's like a it's a coyote mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, so that's me. Um, that's a drawing of me as a coyote. Mm -hmm. uh, that, um, well, I, ha I have this uh, friend I met on Twitter from Syria who is uh, an aspiring uh, artist, like digital artist. And so she drew that on her computer um, because uh, I got in a conversation. I didn't know she was an artist during this conversation mm -hmm. where um, I, I saw, um, well, I'll go back a step further. My best friend who I've mentioned twice, I think, um, and I, uh, people have always told him that he's like a panda. Mm. And if you meet him, you'd totally see it. <laughs> because, uh, anyway, he kind of looks like a panda, acts like a panda. Mm. Um, and so he looked up panda on like spiritanimal.org. Mm -hmm. And everything about it fit him. Mm. And so I asked him, uh, what do you think I would be? Mm -hmm. um, and he looked through a couple of them and he sent me the coyote one. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it fit me perfectly. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's like paradoxical, difficult to categorize. Um, uh, and the, the one he said fit me the most was uh, uh, wisdom with a sense of humor, which you know mm -hmm. I take as a great compliment. Um, and so I, I I, I took that in the panda and the coyote mm -hmm. and I was like, wouldn't it be cool to have a cartoon of us mm. uh, as like con men, like snake oil salesmen in the 1930s uh, as a panda and a coyote. Uh, and we just like travel the countryside trying to, trying to make a living. Hmm. And so uh, I, I relayed that idea to uh, this girl from Syria. And she was like, I would totally draw that just for practice. And, and so she did. And now we kind of have this, uh, this rapport, this, this relationship where um, uh, I'll sort of uh, be absentmindedly, absentmindedly come across these uh, ideas of things that I'd like to see an artist's interpretation of. Mm -hmm. And I'll let her know, like, uh, hey, you should take a whack at drawing this or that. You know, so sometimes she'll be uh, not busy, not too busy to actually do it. Cool. And so all, all that is to say, like, um, I see these very cool images in my head that uh, I, I just can't get my hands to make with a pencil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can, I think I can relate to that because like, I, I probably, I, I can see cool images in my head too, but you know, I can't, I can't draw them either. But I think how I try to create them is um, I, I can knit really well. And so I try to do that instead of drawing and be creative with that. And um, I think that helps because then it is a way I can be creative that is easier for me to do. Yeah, be, uh, be visually creative without having to pick up the dreaded pencil. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it, I mean, you're right, without picking up a pencil, and it's, it's kind of, it's easier for me at least because I have both hands occupied and you can be very colorful with knitting with the different colors of yarn that you use and which is similar with drawing. And um, I've been doing it for, um, very and long. when you're done, you don't just have a picture, you have a nice quilt with a picture on it. Right, you have something you can use. You can exactly, yeah. Wear it, um, or you can cover yourself with it. Yeah. 
Um, so um, let's see. I think we, I, I agree. I think we probably are down with the quirkiness of NLD, unless you can think of anything else. No, no. Um, maybe we could do a follow up if we, you know, start thinking about it and realize there's a ton of things we missed. But yeah, I, yeah. I think that just about covers it for one episode. I would agree. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I want to uh, thank you for letting me interview you. I, Absolutely, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I really had a lot of fun doing this. Um, Whether it's dating with NLD, living with it, or being quirky because we have it, I and others who have NLD still experience these issues today. In conclusion, I would like to hear from my audience if you know individuals that I could interview for this podcast, that would be extremely helpful to know. What are you interested in learning about NLD? I know I'm not an expert, but I do know I have the living experience of having it. I would like you to practice journaling about your gifts and differences. Also see if there is a way that you can make that difference become easier for you than it originally was. One thing I find helpful is the app called Fitbit. It automatically can tell you when you are exercising, help you keep track of your fitness goals, and remind you to walk around throughout the day. When you are exercising regularly, everything else in life becomes easier, especially sleeping. Hey, I've just learned about a nonprofit that I would really like to support. It's the NVLD Project. In addition to doing research on NVLD and working to get it back on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM, they provide support groups for those with NVLD. You can find the NVLD project at www.nvld.org. This is where I often turn for those real-life stories I use in these podcasts. All proceeds will go towards the NVLD project. Thank you for listening today, and I hope you learned some new things today. Bye.